Welcome everyone. I am honored to have the opportunity to introduce Ms. Daisy Freed. This week, she begins her tenure as Westchester University po Poetry Center's Fall 2020 Poet in Residence. For those of you who do not know, Ms. Freed was born in Ithaca, New York, and she grew up in upstate New York. She graduated from Swarthmore College. Daisy Freed is an award-winning author of three poetry collections, all published by the University of Pittsburgh Press, Women's Poetry, Poems, and Advice, named by Library Journal as one of the five best books of 2013. My brother is getting arrested again, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and she didn't mean to do it, which won the Agnes Lynch Starrett Prize. She has been awarded Guggenheim, Hotter and Pew Fellowships, a Pushcart Prize, the Cohen Award from Plowshares, the editor, and the Editor's Prize for a feature article from Poetry for Seeing God Awful Muse about reading Paradise Lost, Breastfeeding, and the Importance of Difficulty. Recently, her poems have been published in or are forthcoming in American Poetry, London Review of Books, Poetry, PN Review, Zocalo, Three Penny Review, Poetry International, and many other journals and anthologies. She says that her most, quote, most recent creative preoccupation has been writing versions of Baudelaire poems, finding intersections for their themes and imagery with contemporary life and sometimes in contemporary idiom. Currently, she's poetry editor for the literary resistance journal Scoundrel Time, occasionally reviews poetry for the New York Times and elsewhere, and is a member of the faculty at Warren Wilson College MFA program for writers and lives in Philadelphia. Freed's work has been praised for her brilliant use of humor, her keen attention to detail, her sharp critical eye, and her mastery of the lyric as well as narrative modes. So, critics such as Jason Guriel at PN Review have praised Freed's most recent collection, arguing that women's poetry, quote, locates Freed as one of the masterful American poets of her generation. Much more than this has been said and could be said about her impressive contributions to contemporary American poetry and poetics. But I think it's time that we give, for me to give the floor to Daisy Freed. At the end of her reading, we will have question and answer period. Please use the chat feature to ask questions. The host, Cindy Pila, and myself will share your questions with Daisy. Also, we would like to remind you that we are selling her books online. The link will be in the chat. So without further ado, Daisy Freed. Thank you. Um... I'm very pleased to be reading for you. This is my first. Um, this is my first Zoom reading ever. So, um, I've been um, reading all kinds of advice about what I should do to prepare for it and what I should, how I should light it, and things like that. And I pretty much am ignoring all of it because. Um, but I'm so pleased to be reading for the Westchester University Poetry Center. Um, and to be your virtual writer in residence, which makes me feel a little bit like I'm not quite real, but these are unreal times. So I guess that's that's um, that's appropriate. Um, I'm thinking Professor Pollard and um, Cindy Pilla and Jesse Waters, who first invited me to do this quite a while ago, and to all the students and the staff and the faculty of the university um, who've made this happen. I'm gonna start by asking if you're registered to vote. And if you're not registered, please make sure you register soon. Um, in Pennsylvania, October 19th is the registration deadline. You can do this on time on, online. You should Google um, register to vote in PA and you'll, you'll find several links to get you the answers you need. It really couldn't be easier. You still have time to request an absentee ballot if you're worried about going to the polls, but do it quickly. Um, and um, I'm just going to do this. This is this is my ballot right here. And I'm just doing this because I filled it out earlier today. You have to put it inside the security envelope, okay? I promise we'll get to poetry. Um, and seal the security envelope or they won't count it. 
before putting it into the mailing envelope, okay? So I'm just going to do that and close this. And of course, I'm not telling you who to vote for. Not at all. I would never do such a thing. Um, and just, I would never ever tell you who to vote for in a, in a situation like this. Okay, so um, the other thing I really need to tell you is that my husband um, died last week. He was uh, ill for a very long time. So um, it, wasn't, it wasn't unexpected, um, but it still has hit hard. And Professor Pollard said I could postpone the reading if I wanted to. Um, but the thing is, I will be missing him for a long time. And we were very much partners in the art of writing. Um, he was a journalist and a fiction writer. And we read everything the other person wrote in early and late drafts. And um, I, this is, for students in the aud audience, this is an important thing to have in your life. Somebody who is, um, who both likes your work and also who will be frank with you about it, which is not just always bucking you up, but telling you what they think is working, what they, they think uh, is not working. And Jim and I did that for each other and I'm very lucky to have had him not only as my husband, but also as a wonderful eye on my work. So I'm dedicating this reading to Jim Quinn. There he is. Um, I think I was actually pregnant with our daughter when I took that picture about 13 years ago. So um, I do need to tell you that a few of my poems has content that might make me a little bit emotional and I don't wanna embarrass anyone. Uh, if it gets too hard, I'll just move on to something else. Um, but poetry and life are the same thing for me and death is part of life. And so I'm just doing this reading. So um, I will start with a recent prose poem. Um, you, you may know what, uh, at this point in a live reading, I would say, who knows what a bot bag is? And you would raise your hands. Um, uh, it's a kid's toy, right? That you blow up and has sand in the bottom and it's a punching bag that stands up again after you punch it. Um, usually they have figures on them like a clown or a burglar. My daughter has one that she likes to paste a photograph of Trump's face on and then start punching it. Um, so um, th this poem is, is not literally about her or the bot bag that she uses, but um, bot bag starts with a, a there's an epigraph from uh, Gertrude Stein's Wars I Have Seen. There is no love interest in these modern wars. Bot bag. When he deflates horribly flat with sticky crinkling noises, I peel his body from other parts of his body probe with my pinky, squeeze with index and thumb, put my mouth to his valve hole, breathe him fat again. I punch, he hisses, he's mine, and I sock him. He flops backward, jerks upright, ballasted by sand in his sack bottom, filled with my breathed, breathed air. I punch and I punch him and I punch him, I dance on my toes like a boxer, lean to let him hit me in the face with his face, not hard. He crumples about the ears, tapping me. I swim in my make-believe anger. His sifty sand shifts when I shove my hands under him. Like Susie the color guard carrying her flag, I rest him against my pelvis, shove him out to tumble on his dumb head. He writes himself the instant he hits. I dive at him. We fall together, roll. I lie full on the floor, load his weight on my belly. Did you hear the wind last night punch our pear tree, beat and bend it till it thrashed its blossoms in white suds at the window, at the emptiness in the other direction? Marriage, inventory, what? You, America, hello? So um, I also write critical prose, and sometimes I get invitations from magazines to write something for them. Um, a few years ago, a magazine sent me um, a solicitation saying, our magazine is doing a list of most overrated writers, living or dead. 
Would you like to contribute a pic and a paragraph? No money for this one, but we'd love to have your voice. That little addendum is not uncommon. Um, so I didn't actually contribute a, a, uh, any prose to them at that time, but I did write this poem uh, after getting this um, invitation. And it does have in it a poet um, who is, is actually a great poet who is not overrated, but I think that certain periods of his work might be. So um, this is my response to that invitation. It's called My Housemate of 1989. My housemate of 1989 has short hair, lots of sex, and a nervous way of smoking. Doesn't seem smug, really, when in a clear, carrying voice, she says, I like the idea of having a drawer in the kitchen that's full of unsorted silverware, just a drawer where you throw in the silver any which way. Of the professor she's dating, his skin is just a little loose. I run my fingers over it and feel it move. And thinking as she walks, this summer, what I really want to wear is white t-shirts, men's white undershirts, and jeans shorts, and nothing else all summer. A quarter century later, sitting around like a grown up with a glass of wine, worrying about money, the state of the world, and my life, my housemate's sayings pop into my mind as if they're everything right and true I forgot. Drawer full of unsorted silver, professor refusing to retire, teaching late autumn intensives, nothing but white shirts all summer. And this is a prose poem. It's called A Monkey Thing. Inside the plate glass window, I'm putting my whites in and bleach and my denims and lights, darks and hots and hand washes. When the tour bus grinds to the curb outside to drop the teenage Southwest Drum and Bugle Corps at Clean Laundry, South Philly. There it idles, its slab side silver, decaled script and musical notes, America colored. The kids debark pell-mell and fill apologetically the aisle between the washers and dryers, politely vying to put loads in, bonking their duffels to the ground, pausing confused at the change machine, chucking chains of quarters into their hands and the little basin. They excavate Tide Pods, their moms left like chocolates in their bag bottoms. One drops to the floor. I pick it up. In my hand, it has the weight and flex of a small testicle. I hand it back. I'm invisible as air in the interstices of their conversation. Caden, Corey, Braden, Jordan, Jaden, or Jerry from Albuquerque or Pasadena made some mistake at last night's armory showcase. So they didn't win, but gave it their all, made strides and their best effort. They'll shake it off and next year, nail it. Are we going to see Suicide Squad this afternoon, a teen girl says to a boy group the aisle's full of. They lean at her with meaty lurches, swig from water bottles they unclip from belt loops and nap sacks. But one kid saying how this creepy teacher, he hits on girl students like all the time, it's gross. Does it matter? Does it? In this light, matter? Sorry, I'm a teacher, I say, and a mom, and that shouldn't be happening. You should tell somebody in authority. They nod, shrug, turn to their affairs. It's interesting being invisible, watching myself utterly unwatched. 16, I said to the volleyball player, 28, from my co-ed all ages JCC team who flirted and drove me home after practice. Do you want to fool around? Sounds nice, he says, he said, never touching me, waiting for me to get out of the car, never offered to drive me home again. I heard he died young, though he lives in my mind today with his bald spot, hard spike, already fattening belly. If you get up early in Paris and walk to the zoo so you get in just as it opens, pay your way in, past the other dispiriting exhibits with the cud chewers, their tongues hanging out, and the sadness of thick-tailed leopards in cramped tiny jungle spaces, barely able to prowl down a hill, 
and ignoring the shitty peacocks displaying their iridescent astonishments to no one who cares with stressful screams like babies in pain. Then you might round a corner if you're early enough to see the baboons come out like clowns from an improbable car released fighting from their unknowable indoor pens to the outdoor space along the artificial rock face where they spend their daytimes. And your baby girl, a perpetual warm lump in your arms, extends her arms towards them. They were quiet all night, you believe, and if not free now, freer. And they flash, swing, jump, chatter, and shriek at each other. They're so killingly angry. Why don't they kill each other? There are so many of them. How could they fit inside wherever they are nights? And do they hate? Is hate a monkey thing? Is anger a constant baboon state? Or is it the tiniest opportunity in the suggestion of breeze on the outdoor air that changes things? It's like an energy, electric, transferring beast to beast to beast. Any dissipation barely noticeable at first. But there's an eventual stilling until bored, they settle down to watch themselves watched. How inexperienced I am. How inexperienced I still am. Bad daughter. It's my own mother I think of when in the hot car, it hurts me to watch my painstaking girl return from the water ice kiosk balancing three lemon ices in a four hole tray. Plastic spoons fanned in her fist, wad of napkins wedged between the ices. When a gust makes the napkins riffle, then gamboling lift off, like and unlike ones that went before. Fair girls in festival dresses, dancing up the street, leaving her at the curb in flip flops and sweat shorts looking through the car window to see if I'm mad. I believe Maisie sometimes reads my poems. It's my daughter, she's 13. And I believe she read that one and she said that she wasn't worried that I was mad. So, um, so um, uh, Cherise mentioned that I um, have been working on these translations from uh, Baudelaire. And they're, they're mostly, I would say, afters and versions. They take great liberties, but um, I'm going to read some of these. Um, my project has been, this, this started this spring when I was just idly paging through a book of John Ashbery's translations um, of, from the French. And he had, I think he only had one Baudelaire translation of the poem uh, Paysage, which means land, landscape. And, um, you know, Ashbery's a great poet, but I must tell you, I thought his, his translation of this poem was utterly awful. Um, and my French is fairly poor. It's like high school, bad high school French, very primitive, but I can get the gist. And I just thought I can do better. I think that's probably uh, how a lot of translators start doing things. Um, so this one is, is, is um, takes some liberties with the original. Um, my goal at first was just to achieve a good poem in English and better than Ashbury. Um, but once I finished this translation, I realized this was very much a quarantine poem and also a poem for a time of the occasional riot. So this is um, Baudelaire's Paysage. To compose my sexless eclogues, I will bed down near the sky like the astrologers and neighbor to bell towers, listen dreamily to the somber wind carried hymns. Chin in hand, high up under the slant roof, I'll see the factories chatter and sing song, their chimneys and steeples, those masts of the city, and the giant sky dreaming of eternity. It's sweet through mists to watch a star born in the blue, lamp at the window, rivers of coal climbing the sky, moon pouring sorcery. Up there I'll see springtime, I'll see summer, fall, and when winter comes with monotone snow, I'll close curtains and blinds and build my fairy palaces in the night. I'll dream of blue bright horizons 
of gardens, of fountains crying and alabaster, of kisses, birds singing evening and morning, all that infantile idol. And when riot storms impotent at my window, I won't get up from my desk. I'll be plunged voluptuous in calling forth spring by force of will, freezing sunshine from my heart, making of my burning thoughts a gentler weather. So once I did that one, I realized I wanted to do more. Um, I think a lot of people have been experiencing this very strange difficulty with writing um, from quarantining or you know COVID or just the really strange political times that we're in. Um, and I think that this project has allowed me to have all the excitements of working on poems um, without having to start with a completely blank slate, you know, so, you know, um, but I don't really, the thing is, I don't actually really like Baudelaire. Um, I find him florid and very highly adjectival and seriously Latinate, which is not really his fault since French is a Latinate language. Um, but um, he's kind of ghoulish and gothy and over the top, right? Um, he's kind of a sicko. Um, and, and I'm not saying I'm not a sicko, but you know, um, he's, a, he's a great poet, but he's just not really my taste. And yet he seems so to be so right for this very serious moment. It's like a heightened moment when, um, um, like allows me to write with more heightened language than usual and with like an ostentatious sincerity that I normally wouldn't wouldn't do in my own voice. Um, in each poem I've translated, I've, I've made, I felt like I, um, I could do anything I wanted with it really. I wasn't really trying to, you know, honor Baudelaire. He's, he's been honored um, a lot um, by very good translators, John Ashbery aside. Um, but uh, I, I was felt willing to stray from, um, far from the original in the idiom or the format or the structure. Um, I, but I've been de baudelaire the Baudelaire. Um, sometimes I transfer poems entirely from Paris to Philly in the 20, 21st century um, while retaining imagery and structure. So anyway, um, I'm gonna read a few more of these. Um, this one is after Baudelaire's poem, uh, Le Crepuscule du Matin, which means, which literally means morning, dawn, morning dusk. Um, the French used the word crepuscule to mean dawn and dusk. Um, I translated that as daybreak. And this one is set um, entirely in Philly this year. Daybreak. Helicopters sang out in the South Philly sky and morning wind blew branches against our windows. It was the hour my dreams swarm twisted me pale on my pillow when like a bloodshot eye darting and twitching the last lamp stained the day in carnadine, where trapped in my surly body, I recast the battle between lamp and day as my struggle between intention and accident. And like a face wiped dry by breezes, the air was full of thrilling, fle fleeing things, anger, change. I was tired of writing, or you were. You were tired of fucking or I was. This and that torched boutique sent up smoke. Somebody heaved a planter into another storm, store window. The shopkeeper put the safety back on his sidearm with stinging eyes dialed his insurance adjuster. Someone danced on a police car. Someone blew up an ATM and his hand off with it. Women who forgot to stop bearing children mopped their brows and chewed on ice. It was the hour when, sweating and starving, they gave birth to their latest, moaning and cursing. Like a sob cut short by foaming blood, a siren, another, tore, the fabric, tore through the fabric of mourning. Buildings snuffled like marine mammals bedded down in smog sea. Old ones in nursing homes, their minds gone, hawked up last juddering breaths. They'd been abandoned as I sometimes wish to abandon you. Someone crept home, broken by stupidity. Shivery Dawn, in her green-pink shift, crawls up the Schuylkill into the parklands. Angry, Philly, rubbing her eyes, grabs up her tools again, that old worker. 
Um, whenever um, Baudelaire uses um, a masculine uh, pronoun, um, which or, or or would his his uh, his I is is male and his you is uh, is female. Um, um, I've I've flipped that, you know, because I want to have fun too, and I want my gaze to be the gaze um, on the other people, um, rather than you know. Anyway, um, so um, so the worker in that poem in Baudelaire is is male. And the worker in my poem is female, among other things. Okay, so anyway, um, Baudelaire has four, I've never read these before, so I'm just like working through them. Um, Baudelaire has four poems called Spleen, which I um, translate as temper, and I'm just gonna read one of them to you. Temper. I got more crap up here than if I lived a thousand years. A filing cabinet stuffed with credit card statements, doggerel, love letters, subpoenas, paperback novels, heavy locks of sex partner's hair folded up in paper, hides fewer secrets than my blasted brain. It's a mausoleum, enormous walk-in freezer, holds more dead than a mass grave. I'm a graveyard the moon hates, where remorse is the tunneling worm chomping through my dearest departeds. I'm an old bedroom stuffed with wilted roses, strewn with last year's cast off fashions, where sick pastels of fatted boucher babies stink of talc and the open bottle. The limping days are so fucking long, snowed under by years and years and years and years. Say it, boredom born of apathy achieves immortality. Body, you're nothing, bag of dread and granite crag, magma cooled, old sphinx in a fog, mumbling to self, forgotten by the whole giddy world, haranguing in the dying light. This is after Baudelaire's Les Ibus, which is owls. Owls. In black yew shelters, owls tuck themselves away, strange gods with red meditating shifty eyes otherwise roost unstirring till the melancholy hour when darkness shovels the sun off stage. Thus they teach the sage she need fear in this world, only tumult and action. Passing, drunk on shadows, my punishment for desiring change is desiring more change. Got two more Baudelaire's and then a final poem. Um, all right, Autumn Song. This is after Baudelaire's Chant d'Automne, which I can't pronounce because I don't speak French well, but it means Autumn Song. Soon the plunge in dark and cold. Goodbye too soon to summer's limpid light. Already I'm hearing firewood thump, its hollow pavement shocks, winter feelings, rush in, wrath, loathing, thrills of dread, sentence of hard labor. And like the sky in its polar hell, my heart will freeze a meaty block. I shudder listening to each log chopped, a gallows being built has that muffled echo. My mind's a teetering parapet annihilated by a battering ram below. Rock abide by this metronomic knock Seems someone hasty is nailing shut a coffin. For whom? It was just summer, now fall. This odd noise rings out like loss. I love the blue light in your long eyes. Comely one, but today I'm bitter. And nothing, not our love or bed or hearth, is worth sunlight dappling the sea. But, darling, adore me, be my daddy, I'll be your naughty ingrate. Or anyway, lover, brother, be the passing amity of autumn glory, setting sun. Quick work, the greedy tomb awaits. Ah, let me kneel, head resting on your knees. 
to taste grieving for burning summer, these good, late, mellow, yellow rays. Okay, um, one more Baudelaire. Um, all right, I can do this. This is um, from his, his uh, Je n'ai pas oublié, um, I have not forgotten, and it's for Jim Quinn. I have not forgotten neighbor, our red brick row house, tiny and quiet, with the window always cracked open, even in winter, and us rolling together into the middle of the dented mattress. A rooster in someone's courtyard crowing in the gray, lording it over his harem of illegal chickens. We're like gods, we couldn't stop being naked. Those evenings the sun, superbly streaming, broke its sheaf of colors on the glass, seemed a giant inquisitive eye, watching our long quiet suppers, its reflection spritzing like candlelight on the frugal tablecloth and on the strewn pages of your manuscripts. Okay, made it. Um, one more poem and uh, this is a, a bit of a longer poem and it's, um, Back to me, Baudelaire didn't help me with this directly. Um, but um, the, the poem takes place mostly at a pet store where a girl of about 11 or 12 is trying to figure out what, fe what to feed her new garter snake. Um, it's nar narrated in her mother's voice, but the girl has a number of extended conversations inside the poem um, with a pet store worker. And there is always dialogue also, di excuse me. There's also dialogue and description of scenes from a uh, a Hepburn Bogart, the Hepburn Bogart movie, The African Queen, and the girl also sings in this poem, the Pirate Jenny song from the Three Penny Opera, and recites parts of the Edward Lear poem, The, Jum the Jumblies. Um, and this poem is called The Jumblies. Um, the Jumblies, analogy. This is analogy. Um, one, one, back room at Monster Pets. My mother is dying. That also happened this year. It's been 2020. Um, okay, I'm sorry, the jumblies. One, back room at Monster Pets. My mother is dying. A snake's complete nutritional package is mouse, but my girls was weaned on earthworm by the Hurricane Utah breeder who overnighted the garter in a dampened petri dish packed in a cooler with dry ice and so refuses mice. Eating worms, worm for a snake is like eating donuts, she says, worried as a mother. She's discussing the problem with Buck, reptile expert at the pet store, crap job he loves, newly identifying boy, new name. Buck has an interesting but inessential part to play in this poem. Sure, we have night crawlers, he says, tossing his back, bang back. Ring bell for feeders, says the sign on the swinging back door room he came out of. They're live in dirt in tins, he says. You cut a chunk, a snake will like its scent and wiggle. Says, or try feeder fish, pop them live in the freezer, cut chunks and thaw. Some snakes prefer it to worm. In the back room, live mice in cages, peach fuzzies, hoppers, L, XL, like clothing sizes, feeder corral, diminuendo, crescendo, red hot's eyes, squeak aria when a hand comes in. I wouldn't get involved with li in live ones, Buck says. Then you have to stick with them. Anyway, your garter snake's too small. Crickets shatter around in packets. Buck hoists a jar in which a teal hornworm, thick as a finger, climbs the glass above a horror sea of brother hornworms. Remember Bogart near the end of the African Queen, shuddering with leeches, expelling gasping odium as he slides back into the teeming swamp to drag the boat from the muck it's stuck in? He and Hepburn think it's their only hope for getting back to open water, which turns out is just a few feet away but they can't see that yet. 
Or grubs, says Buck. 20 cents each, six for a dollar. Grubs, waxworms, look like dead flesh in a 19th century novel subjected to galvanic experiment. Fatty, says Buck. They'll fat your snake right up. Or superworms, flexing their segments, prized for moisture and protein. But I don't recommend them unless you crush their heads first. They bite. Hepburn and Bogart think they've come to the end, lying in the boat bottom in the buzz, buggy buzzing delta reeds, filth smeared, thinking they're dying. Then it starts to rain. My mother was thinking of dying. I am thinking of me as a kid in my room, listening late to my mother pound down the stairs in her nightgown again, to my sister screaming in terror again, terrified, my mother says, of time. The tick of the clock, and the frozen swick, swick of its hands, and my sister trapped in it. I am thinking of my mother holding my sister and pulling her out of it, and of me listening to her loving her, while Buck says, my girl can pet the ball python, warrior, while she decides what snake feed she wants, till warrior hides her head under her neck in fear or overstimulation. Two. Another day at Monster Pets. Buck at a wall of slide out reptile terrariums on custom runners. Buck putting in feed, changing water, staring into a terrarium fitted out with rocks, a twisted branch, plastic vine, and tiny waterfall. His belt, belt buckle, a rampant cobra, bolero tie, amber clasped, in which a fossiled, wa a fossiled wasp. Insignificant Buck Burgomaster. Who doesn't love his name? While Buck and the girl are talking snake, I'll mention the dream. We'd all forgotten for weeks and months to feed our pet pot-bellied pig. I jerked partway out of the dream, literally leapt out of bed like a kangaroo rat, sprung, and ran to wake the girl, remembering just before I pounded on her door that we've no such pet, no pig. Also that she was snuggled in my bed downstairs around the little heap of cat having wakened to what she called a tiny clapping sound, whereupon she turned on the bedside lamp and found a ladybug trying to escape out the window. Scooped it with a bit of paper. She was always casting paper around her bed, saying spells to repel demons. And now she ran to rehome the ladybug on a potted primrose out back. Bugs saved, she grew freaked at night sounds, so climbed in with me. Awake, I went back to bed, faintish. Next morning, I told her the dream. She laughed, quite grown in daylight, eating a donut, mouth sugary, and ever since, mom, stop feeding the pig when I try to solve problems that don't exist. And here's as good a place as, as any to mention. She's gazing rather wiggly into the gecko terrarium that her father, Unsolvable problem, mostly absent because mostly sick, maybe losing his mind, makes us what? Lonely and tethered and free. And makes me shout, doesn't make, I let myself shout. So think of me shouting, snake with mouth unhinged to fit a universe of mice. Not at her, but do we think anger is a good green place for her to live in? Check a box, yes, no. Maybe. Dialogue. Where's Warrior, says the girl. We sold her, said Buck, says Buck. How's your garter? So the girl gets to tell her brilliant story, swells with the pride of it. I gave her live worm chunks. After a few days, I rubbed a bit of mouse gut on the worm. Heather, I named her, glumped. The worm segued down her body, diminished as it traveled. Next, I made a stew of worm and mouse. That's a slightly formal way she sometimes talks. Bogart, what happened? Hepburn, we did it, Charlie, we did it. Bogart, but how? And then, says the girl, she switched entirely to mouse. Perfect, says Buck, the encourager. So, says the girl, we gave the worms to friends in Germantown with chickens. Buck. So what do you need today? The girl, a black light to warm her at night that won't keep me up with its light. Three, in her room, my mother is dead. 
In her room with the blackened light, what the girl sings. And the ship, the black freighter, disappears out to sea. And on it is me. Then switches off from Blitzstein Brecht to Edward Lear. And everyone cried, you'll all be drowned. Royal blue rubber glove drowning her hand, singing now and turning poem to slow, low blues. She sings when interested and happy. They called aloud, our sieve ain't big, but we don't care a button, we don't care a fig, in a sieve we'll go to see. What she does slides the screen off the top of the tank. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live. Her slow jam slows, their heads are green and their hands are blue and they went to sea in a sieve. What Heather does smites head at the girl's blue finger and mouse spreads Heather's maw. What glove does when the girl flings it hangs deflated over the trash can edge. Weather, sultry summer, windows up, cat, spreads its little knives against the, the snake tank. Meow, says the girl to the cat. Now we have to leave Heather alone, she says, or she'll throw up. Heavily dragging, husband pokes his head in, bright blue, eyes bright blue, his crossness letting us know he's all there today. Remember the African queen cruising putt-putt through jungle, hippos, gunfire threatening from the banks through headache sun, Chucked whiskey bottles, busted boilers over rapids, over falls, stalling in weeds, rising on rainfall into the big lake, headed for the German boat. Oh, what's she singing now? Back to pirate Jenny, asking me, kill them now or later? What she figures, that there's an adventure downriver, a brave joking pal, rapids to ride, wipe out on coming up laughing, looking for open water, an enemy ship to blow up. What to do with the boy buck? With the asymmetrical hair, nose and ear bling, buckle boots and cracking adolescent voice. Leave him upriver like life. Not everyone has to mean something. Some come in, then fall by the way, like a beautiful house lit up for the season you saw on your road trip you never went back to. What's in her head? All of it, grubs, worms, snakes, too wild really to cage, geckos, fish, crickets, mice, shed skin, shed skin, crap jobs we were half in love with even as we hated them. Can't we grab more and more of life? All the stories and the holding. I worry she feels trapped, but no, it hardly matters. Where we live by a church, they're singing. What we said when the girl was little, we don't believe in God, but you can. Show tune turns to something someone hopes is holy. Fire above water. It's the permanent silences, the prospect darkening, blink, lights out. Mother dead. Can't go to the funeral. That's what I'm saying. Glory, river's end. Glory. Thank you. So, Oh, there's Cherise. She'll tell us. Here I am. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I was hoping, yes, Gloria, it was wonderful. And there's so much applause and there's um, this kind of, all kinds of wonderful things people are saying. And I have a, I think this is a question from Nina Schaefer. Hi, Nina. And same. Daisy, R.E. Baudelaire, I love your thought that translation was a way to have something with which to begin at a time when it is especially hard and be, and triggered by being annoyed at someone else's bad translation. But of course you read your own, your own powerful work as well, Snakes and Worms and Dermatown Chickens and Song. Yes, brilliant and fresh, thank you. That wasn't a question, it was a statement. Thank you. You, you can read out all those nice comments if you want to. Um, from Walker Kressler, thank you for your words and emotional courage and honesty, Daisy. I'm sitting with your Swarthmore College contemporary, Claire Brill, sends her greetings. Karen Ryle, congrats, oh, Daisy. That was a question. Um, uh, question. Um, question for you, Daisy, from Emma. Um, uh, do you have any advice for those who are trying to write their first poetry book? 
how do you get started? How do you stay disciplined and inspired? Um, oh, it's a, uh, I, you know, my first thought was like, I don't know, but I guess I did write one. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, I think you just, well, for me, I've never been a, uh, uh, a project writer, except maybe now with the Baudelaire, but like, I've always just written poem by poem by poem until I have enough. Um, so if you, I think you just have to feel your way forward and just write, um, write a lot and read a lot and make poems and show them to people you trust to, you know, respect where you're coming from and also to give you frank advice. And, um, you know, it's, it takes a long time. It takes years for me to write a book. Um, I don't think with my first book, I knew I was writing it for a long time. And then I had a whole bunch of poems. And I'm like, hmm, I think I have a bunch of poems. I think this might be a book. And then it took a while longer. So staying disciplined um, and inspired. I think I, I, I just, you, I think you just have to live your life and do things you'd love to do. And you need to read a lot. Um, inspiration is, is partly from reading other poets, but it's also partly just from being out in the world and looking around, it's, which is harder right now for us to go out and walk around and interact. But um, for me, um, for me, not writing is important to my writing. So stopping writing and, and doing other things. Um, as for staying disciplined, I think it's a good idea to, to I like to I say this to like students and their teachers tend to be mad at me for saying it, but I actually think you should set your goal low, you know, because um, um, this is only if you're like me, right? But like, if I, like I, I'd always decide to get in shape, right? Like I'm perpetually deciding to get in shape and like maybe I'll join a gym and I'll like go to the gym the first day and I'll like do 40 minutes on a stair climber and then I'll lift weights and then like I'll do yoga and then I'll go swim. I'm not literally, but like, you know, I, I do that kind of thing and then I don't go back the next day, right? So um, my advice is always like, just, you know, do 10 minutes a day, see what you got you know, um, and chances are at the end of the week, you'll have a bunch of writing. A lot of the time you'll go on longer because you love writing, right? Mm -hmm. But just, you know, like also write badly. Don't, don't try to write well, write as badly as you want to. And um, you'll find out that you have material and you'll find out that you haven't written badly, that you have good stuff. So I hope that's helpful. Wonderful. Thank you. Here's a question from Caden Unger. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you for your wonderful reading. So, uh, during such a difficult time, poetry can be both therapeutic and painful. So I commend you. May both your husband's and your mother's memory be a blessing. My question is about your residency. I'd like to ask what you're most looking forward to while being Westchester's poet in residence. Is there a specific topic you're thinking of writing more about? So it looks like there's two questions. So. <laughs> uh, my residency, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting people um, virtually, to seeing all your faces and talking to you about poetry as much as possible. I think, um, I think some of, a lot of the, uh, the, the, um, the stuff we have scheduled is, is interactive, right? Yes. Think, yeah, so um, I'm looking, I like to talk about poetry with people who like to talk about poetry. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, and um, I, I don't really write by thematic content so much. I end up writing a lot about my life, although I don't think about, I don't think of myself as a confessional poet or an autobiographical poet, which is hilarious because I just read you a poem about a woman who has a sick husband whose mother died and has a, a, a daughter who has a snake named Heather, which if you know anything about me, all those things are true of me. But that's sort of not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to give you myself. I'm, I'm, this is, I just use my life for my material. Um, but, um, so, um, it's every eye is a dramatic eye, right? So it's the dramatic, it's the dramatic, it's the dramatic version of. Yeah. And I think that, I think that I is a, is a, actually a strategy. Yeah. You know, it's a strategy for immediacy. Um, sometimes I don't use I, but, um, I, I, I put in a, any as much fiction as I want to. I sometimes claim to be things I'm not at all. Um, and I'm really just trying to make um, good poems about human experience and emotion and ethics and behavior and how pers the personal intersects with the political, things like that. So um, 
Yeah, so I guess I don't have a topic I'm writing about. I'm aiming to write poems that get at the right emotional um, and ethical complications and imbalances and balances. Yeah. Well, oh, thank you. Um, another question from Tessia Weiprecht. Um, when translating poetry from another language, what is your process? How do you determine what's important? Meter, word choice, rhyme, etc. How do you decide what to change? Right. So um, uh, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, what um, this is really a very early foray into translation. I um, I haven't I've done almost none of it none before. So um, I I feel like a little bit like a imposter, but you know we all feel like imposters in our lives. So um, I'll just tell you my experience. Um, I think that you you're quite right. Translators do have to decide what they're going to privilege. Um, some people try to get the meter and the rhyme into it, right? Some people try to get the thematic content. Some people go for the tone. And for me, um, I would say the things I'm retaining most is sort of structure and imagery and mood, if that makes sense, um, while, while adding a whole bunch of stuff in. Um, changing, I mean, I'm doing things like changing line breaks. Um, you know, some of, some of my Baudelaire poems have very short in jam lines, which he didn't do, you know. Um, um, Sometimes I go so far away that I, you know, you wouldn't recognize the Baudelaire. Um, so I'm really kind of just trying to imp improvise as I go along. But what I do is I, you know, I read the poem in French and um, I, I have a couple people I'm reading, I'm reading translations of one I think is terrible and one who's very good. And um, I look at those not too hard because I don't want to take what they do too much but just to get a sense just because I do have this kind of um, um, as I said my, my my knowledge of French is is primitive at best so I, I'm, I don't want to miss stuff you know um, but um, then what I do is like don't tell okay because this is embarrassing but I like to put chunks of it into Google Translate and um, I then sort of rewrite that in contemporary idiom um, and take it where it needs to go. And I read you some of them where I'm just putting in a whole lot of contemporary stuff while following the structure of the poem and following some of the imagery. So like in the Daybreak poem, I had helicopters during the, during the uh, Black Lives Matter demonstrations earlier this year. But then I also, um, I did, I mean, a lot of the stuff about tossing in your bed and the worker, you know, Philly, you know, Philly, that worker, and a lot of the imagery in there was like sort of grabbed from the Baudelaire poem while I was also shoving things into it. So um, I really am taking great liberties, but uh, um, you know, I, I just, I just, you know, uh, I love the whole process of revising, making choices about revising. So in a funny way, I feel like I'm revising Baudelaire. Maybe that's what I should should call it, revising Baudelaire. But so. Um, <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, someone had a question about what made you put the mix the African queen with the poem about snakes. Uh, that's Chris to the panelist. That's a great question. I don't entirely remember, um, but um, my husband loved Bogart and like um, the summer, like he was like, got really annoyed by many movies, but he was never really annoyed by Bogart. So, um, I mean, actually, I, I, wrote, I finished this poem earlier than that, though, but like, I think, I think just like the whole thing about um, Bogart is, and the, the adventure of going down the river and the, the leeches and all the stuff sort of just kind of converged and intersected um, with, uh, with this other stuff. A lot of my process is allowing a bunch of different things to intersect and seeing what happens when I put together disparate things, what happens next. Um, um, I'm trying to think, um, you know, the, the Humphrey, it's a brilliant movie, right? If you haven't seen it. Um, and it, it's also like the beginning of it is really racist, right? Um, this, it starts in an African village with, with uh, white missionaries and Hepburn is a white missionary. And um, it, helpfully, um, the, her, her brother who's the missionary is, um, is also a fatuous asshole, right? So like at least the white people aren't 
you know, they're made fun of, but it's a weird thing to watch right now. Right. And then you go into this, this, um, wonderful movie about two people falling in love and resisting the Germans during world war one and they have adventures and it's very exciting and they almost die. Um, I'm, I'm meandering a little bit, but I think that I'm just sort of taken by the, the complicated act of watching that movie now. And um, I think that's part of why it stuck in my head. And then they really do, it's a happy ending, right? And I've been thinking about happy endings and what's a happy ending, you know? Um, so that's an inconclusive answer. I don't know what, I actually don't know what I meant, why I did that, but it seemed to work once I put it in. So um, one more question and then we'll, um, or maybe two, we'll see where we are with time. Um, uh, Mark Mitchell asks, what difference differentiates a poem uh, from a prose poem for you? Your prose poems sound very lyrical and rhythmic, so I'm not hearing the prose aspect of it. The music of your language, as always, is wonderful. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I uh, I don't I don't differentiate. I don't I don't draw a line between prose poems and lineated poems. Really, um, I. I, f I don't I don't intend to write prose poems. I don't say I'm going to sit down and write a prose poem. Um, I think, for example, the poem about the kids in the laundromat and the baboons. Um, at one point, that was a series of sonnets, but it was just it had no power as with sonnets. You know, I mean, a sonnet is not just a counting fourteen lines and a certain number of syllables. It's uh, it's volumes and it's energy and a way of thinking, right? And it just wasn't appropriate for what I wanted to do. Um, and I think I turned that into prose. And once I turned it into prose, I was able to engage the sentence more than the, than the line. And I got interested in the sentence and how you get through a sentence and how does it develop and how does it accrue clauses and when do you stop it and how do you, I mean, you give up the power of the line break, the unit of the line break when you're writing prose poems. Um, but then you have to, it, you have to, um, you have to engage some other things like syntax, like variation of sentences. Um, um, the paragraph becomes a unit. And so it becomes this sort of interesting way of dealing with volumes differently. Um, and I don't, I don't think that I um, would ever, um, I'm not particularly interested in categories, I guess I would say. What I'm interested in is how each poem um, carries out its own internal logic what what its requirements it develops as they go along i gave a class in the prose poem at warren wilson the mfa program i teach in and i started by saying i don't you know i don't really know what a prose poem is <laughs> i've been studying it um you know um i my attitude towards this stuff is if you say it's a poem then it's a poem and my i'm interested in is it good what does it tell me you know so i'm not worried i'm not worried about writing conforming to categories very much Great, thank you. One um, final question um, I, from Janie McNeil. I'm still holding on to your quote, royal blue rubber glove, close quote. Can you provide some additional insight to that? <laughs> no, well, um, my daughter for, for a while, when she first got the snake, she, um, she was worried that, you know, reptiles are supposed to carry diseases, right? And, um, uh, so she was wearing rubber gloves. This was before the pandemic when people put on rubber gloves in order to, nitrile gloves in order to, you know, um, try to protect themselves. Um, but so she just had this box of gigantic gloves and she put them on when feeding her snake. And she gets these frozen mice and she puts it on her finger and she puts it right into the snake cage and the snake goes, Hum! and it's like <laughs> exciting and scary and disgusting. <laughs> she deals with it. You know, I don't deal with it. But, um, um, but then like it started to dive with like the Jumblies, a poem that she, she memorized for school. They had to memorize poems at school. So quite a while ago, she memorized the Jumblies at school and probably, I don't remember if this is true, but I'm guessing that she probably just started reciting that poem from memory while she was putting on her rubber gloves and her, the, the Jumblies, their hand, the heads are green and her hands are blue. So I you see like this is why I say go when you go through life life is an inspiration because you 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 know like all this stuff was just sort of once I'm working on a poem it sort of acts as this kind of magnet and things kind of flood in and I try to make image correspondences and you know 
it takes a long time, but uh, um, I just, I try to just be porous in some way when I'm working on a poem. Um, well, um, I, yeah, thank you. Well, I can say with complete confidence that your life and your work, um, your commitment to craft and your commitment to um, the process and your projects are inspiring for all of us. And we're just, um, so um, ha happy to have had this time with you and to begin this um, residency. Um, if there were any other questions, so I'm going to close and, and do, do my spiel. So, but, so thank you for that fantastic reading. Um, for the next uh, six weeks, the, the WCU community will benefit from Ms. Freed's residency in multiple ways. She will be meeting with poetry and creative writing classes, as well as African-American literature, theater classes, and the French Club. She'll be giving two public lectures. Now, this is where I'm gonna share my screen and do some exciting stuff here. Um, let's see, two public lectures. Here we go, Daisy Freed events. I'm scared of me. Ah, two public lectures, two of the schedule of events. The Craft Talk on Coolness on um, October 14th at 11 a.m. and um, the Craft Talk on uh, Singing in the Dark Times on um, November 4th and then uh, the celebratory final reading uh, at 7.30 at night on the 19th of November. Um, we hope that you will join us for all public events and look for announcements on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as all of our, our WCU Poetry website. On the website, um, you'll find information about the Iris and Spencer Undergraduate Poetry Awards. Um, the deadline is February 1st, 2021. The Will Mills Chapbook Award, the Donald Justice Prize deadline's coming up November 15th. Um, our upcoming events include Crafting the Classroom, a poetry and pedagogy conference in February 2021, featuring Black feminist poet and novelist Zeta Elliott, and our spring reading in March. We will be ending this academic year with the launch of WCU Craft Fest, a virtual poetry and arts festival in April 2021. Please stay in touch with us to find out more about our new and exciting programs. I would like to remind you that Daisy Freed's books are for sale. Here we go. Um, at our SSI bookstore website, there's the three of them um, and the cost of each book. Um, and let's see, she will be, we have been sharing the link through the reading and it, and it will be available. Um, throughout her tenure in poet in residence. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the incredible teams that I've had the pleasure of working with, particularly in these times of remote labor and Zoom meetings. Having this network has been a blessing. I am so grateful for the work of so many people. I want to start off with my team at the College of the Art of Arts and Humanities, our Poetry Center in intern, Emma Piccinini, has done an incredible job. Her fingerprints are all over this event. Cindy Pila, the Poetry Center's Administrative Liaison, and Seth Birch, the Digital Content Specialist. These two make the magic happen in so many ways, especially in our Zoom world. I'm grateful for the encouragement of Senior Associate Dean K. Hayden Yoon and Dean Jen Bacon, and I'm thankful for the publicity that Christine Kozich has disseminated on behalf of the Poetry Center. The Poetry Center is supported by two very important councils, the Faculty Advisor Advisory Council, chaired by my colleague in English, Christine Irvin, whose membership includes Kate Stewart, Maureen McVeigh, Christopher Benedict, Martin Delalo, Leonard Kelly, Nancy Pearson, Sophia Sunshine, Vil and Vilsius, and the Poetry Center Advisory Council, chaired by Dean, Dean Yoon, whose membership includes Keen Spencer, Kyle Spencer, Rena Espelot, um, George Reitenauer, Jeff Harden, Kate, and Kate Wickersham, our liaison from the WCU Foundation. David Urbany, the deck director of the SSI Bookstore, has been a tremendous resource. And my colleagues in the Department of English, especially the chair, Aaron Hurt, and our administrator, Sarah Paylor, have been indispensable for getting the word out about this event. President your President Fiorentino's office has provided invaluable leadership during these challenging times. 
I'm also deeply grateful for the work that my colleagues at ABSCUF are accomplishing on our behalf every day. And a special shout out to my colleagues across the state system, ABSCUF, EAPSU, and PCEA for sharing and supporting these programs. I would like to express my gratitude to my family as well as the vast supportive network of neighbors and friends whose continued support and energy I rely upon daily. A heartfelt thank you to all. Please join me as I thank Daisy Freed for this wonderful reading. As the director of the WCU Poetry Center, I'm grateful for each of you. You've taken time out of your busy afternoon to, uh, to join us as we welcome Daisy Freed to, our, uh, to Westchester University. We are so looking forward to her residency. So um, thank you, Daisy. I don't know if you're still here. Um, sorry, I had to do that spiel. Um, uh, so it was like, you know, now for a word from our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. It was a wonderful event and wonderful reading. And we look forward to thank all you so much. for it. So um, have a wonderful evening. And um, yeah, I will, I guess we're signing off. Bye-bye.